Hello, everyone, and welcome to our part two exclusive interview with Marty Farrell and Oxford scholar Dr. Joseph Farrell. Now, in part one, Marty put on the record for the first time his two meetings with the late journalist Danny Casalaro, who died under mysterious circumstances after investigating what he called the octopus wrapped around the advanced Promise software. In part two, we'll go even deeper as we connect Casalaro and his key source, programmer Michael Reconosciuto, to the UFO file through Casalaro's research and Reconosciuto's family, including their connection to the Maury Island case. We'll also look at the strange presence of Robert Maxwell in the Promise case and go deeper on the mystery of Barry Kumnick who adopted the Promise software to a larger program named Brainstorm and may hold the key for who installed the back doors in the program before the Justice Department stole it from Inslaw. Please join us now. Marty, Dr. Farrell, it's great to have you back uh, with us. Now, let's start out with a deep dive here into Promise through the figure of Robert Maxwell. No. <laughs> because I'm going to give you just... Um, a piece of this, and then you can tell me how this could relate to all the things we've seen with Epstein mm -hmm. and Maxwell's mm -hmm. daughter, uh, Ghislaine. Okay. Maxwell in 83 gets into hot water because of these individuals at Sandia of all places. Mm -hmm. And they get in touch with the NSA and they say, you know, this guy has been tapping into software and using those databases and getting information through <laughs> infiltrating the software through his company, Pergamon Press. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's a series of FBI documents that were locked up around this from 1983. Some of them came out briefly through FOIA requests and then were reclassified. <laughs> yes, uh, that. And that, that story's been kicking around since 2017. Yep. Give me, Joseph, why? what kind of connection we could be looking at with an early adopter there, Maxwell, using it. And we know that he's connected not only uh, with the UK intelligence services, but with the Israeli intelligence services, Mossad. Well, Mossad supposedly was one of the, one of the intelligence agencies that purchased the, the Compromise Promise software. Ah. Okay. But Maxwell... What I suspect with with Maxwell and Epstein is is if you if you read the descriptions of what the Promise software was supposed to be able to do, it was the prosecutor's management information system. So it was designed to track all the cases uh, under adjudication by the Department of Justice through the system. As such, because the government computers at that time were on all of these different computing languages, mm -hmm. they had to have a software that was able to read every language the government computers were using and then from that be able to compile databases. Right. So this, this software system is a big database compiler that can track through any computer network using any computer language. That's huge. That means you're dealing with software that is, in my opinion, probably several hundred thousands of lines of code long. So it's comparatively easy to sneak a, a back door into that kind of software and disguise it well. Probably, mm -hmm. your, probably your back door consists of several lines of code that are dispersed throughout the whole program. Okay? Right. So, in other words, it's it's a it's a compartmentalized backdoor. Mm -hmm. Now, what that kind of software would also enable you to do would be to track inventory, and this is why, if you go back and look at the Inslaw case, it would they they submit that it was also being used by intelligence agencies and banks and so on to track financial transactions, mm -hmm. to track drug trade, or in, in the Maxwell's case, human traffic. Right. You know, it's, it's literally an inventory tracker. So there, that's fascinating because the merchandise in that case is, yeah. is actual uh, individuals. Human yeah. Yeah. Human beings. Or drugs, or or the money that you're you're paying off 
you know, your purchase of human beings or drugs or whatever. In other words, this is extraordinarily powerful software, mm -hmm. and it can be adapted to do a multitude of things. This is why I think we're possibly looking at software that's been adapted to algorithmic trading, you know, commodities and stocks and bonds, and so on and so forth. And somebody's got a back door to it. Right. That no one knows who it is. Yes. This, <laughs> uh, well, it explains, you know, Maxwell's involvement really rings a big bell. The Hamilton reaching out to you, it, if we're putting these puzzle pieces together, if you connect those dots to Maxwell and the fact that the case that they're talking about with him is 40 years ago, well, how long has this group been manipulating? I'll tell, you, I'll, tell really you, I'll tell you how long. Guess who's connected to the whole promise case and who actually swore out an affidavit? Who? Adnan Khashoggi. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. The richest man in the world or the most powerful arms dealer. And... Recently assassinated. Right. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, he was right there at the beginning of, of BCCI, you yep. know, and and supposedly taken out by Prince Mohammed bin Salman. In, in That's his, his nephew. Country. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and, and this guy is connected to this whole Promise software story, too. Well, you know, the Saudis, uh, it makes sense, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, because they were supposedly one of the countries that bought the software. Mm. Wow, incredible. So somebody for four decades has been manipulating mm. governments, sovereign governments from outside with this thing. Could be. It's, that's, an extra, that's, it's an extra player. Would you say that? Well, either, look, suppose... Here's the problem, Daniel. Suppose you're the Department of Justice. You just let the contract uh, out to take bids on building this software program for you know tracking cases through the system. And you you put you post this contract, you know, wherever the government posts contracts like this. And you're an you're a foreign intelligence agency. In other words, do you think the KGB and the GRU and MI6 and the Surete and the Bundesnachricht and Dienst and the Mossad and on and on we could go? Do you think that they watch government contracts? Of course <laughs> they do. Sure. Of course they do. Do you think that they would try to position someone inside of whatever corporation would gain the contract to do some of this stuff in order to influence the outcome? Of course they would. Right. So now the question is, is Barry Kumnick or whoever it was at Inslaw putting in this back door, is he acting as someone's agent? Hmm. If not, is he acting for himself or a group of people that are not state actors? That's mm -hmm. the other problem. So in other words, they've got a huge security nightmare on their hands with this story. Absolutely. Now, we, we can assume, in, in my opinion, that it was not the Soviet Union. They may have tried but the reason I don't think it's the Soviet Union is the Farewell case. You remember that case? Oh, right. Of the French, the French running a mole inside the KGB's technical procurements department. And this mole is basically turning over the entire shopping list to the French intelligence, and the French are sharing it with Reagan. Right. And Reagan is saying, oh, wow, you guys got a mole inside the KGB. <laughs> cool. You know, let's let's make sure that the Soviets get their hands on some rotten software. Right, because they need software more than anything. Because they need software more than anything. So the next thing the Soviets do is they have a gigantic explosion shut down one of their natural gas pipelines that was arranged courtesy of this defective software. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, you know, what happens when the Soviet Union decides to have a coup d'etat and overturn Mikhail Gorbachev? The, the coup d'etat doesn't work. Mm -hmm. What coup d'etat allows the telephones and television sets and everything else inside of Moscow to keep working? <laughs> All right. You know, that's a pretty lousy coup d'etat, if you ask me. You know, so I, I suspect, no, you rule out the Soviet Union. As as whoever's planting this back door, yeah. So that leaves you know that leaves the Mossad, the Saudis, the Germans, the French, you know, the the post war Nazis, you know, right? Who knows? Yeah. It leaves an extra player. There's no. It question. leaves an extra player, and nobody knows who it is. The fact that the reason that I I I think when you really look at it, it's so plausible is because Hamilton before he develops the software, is already has the NSA background. Right. So when they're right. looking at him and thinking he's developing this thing, somebody wants to get in there first. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of and course. he must have come to that conclusion. In my opinion, it's possible Look, he did, and which the, is why he reached out. The other thing you're going to do is if you're Bill Hamilton and you've, you've worked in this whole national security arena, are you going to be a little concerned about the security of your software development project? Well, of course you are. Right. So yeah. Hamilton's going to have all sorts of stuff in place at Inslaw to make sure that he can vet the people working on this stuff. And number two, make sure that, that this program is not going to be compromised before it even gets out of Inslaw's possession. And this is where the problem starts. Yes. You know, he's, he's, Hamilton is not a stupid man. You're right. <laughs> By any stretch of the imagination. No. He's, so, he's worked in that national security environment for decades. For decades. Bingo. Yes. So he yeah. understands it quite well. And the NSA, the most secretive of them all. Yeah. yeah. Um, two weird elephants in the room on this as, as we round out the picture of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. One involves Rakana Shudo and his dad. Mm -hmm. And the other one involves your book, uh, which is incredible. If you want information about this case, your book, Hidden Finance, Rogue Networks, and Secret Sorcery, mm -hmm. which is all about uh, the 9-11 and the, the various inconsistencies along with all of the, um, you know, algorithmic trades and all the bizarre things that happened in relation to that uh, incredible incident. Well, um, the 9-11 piece, let's start with that. Well, the 9-11 connection here is this. If you've got this database software that Casolero has been working on and he's you know, got all of his files in his accordion file, and you discover there's been a back. You know, this was this was Casalero's discovery that there were modifications to the software that were made after its theft by the Department of Justice, that were intentionally put in the software by the government. Okay, I'm going a step further. Well, then why does why does the modification have to be added after the theft? What if the modification occurs way before that, and it's a modification that nobody knows about, including Hamilton himself? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, If that's the case, then you've got software, all of the Chinese spy guy, mm -hmm. that can be used to tap into government databases that otherwise you could not tap into. And here's why that's important. Remember 9-11 and the telephone calls to the White House that are disclosing all of those top secret code names? Oh, yeah. Yes. How did whoever get them? We still don't know whoever that was that was doing all of this. Wow. But George Bush sure has to scramble his bony little you-know-what to Barksdale Air Base to and then from Barksdale to Offutt, which are the two Air Force bases that are the backup command and command center for America's strategic nuclear forces. He has got to reestablish personal control over of the nuclear ar arsenal. Over the nuclear arsenal. Fascinating. Because someone else has just taken away the key code. What mm. are we talking about now with Biden, Enco, and Trump? Right. This is the Trump raid, mm -hmm. and they're trying to put the implication in there, mm -hmm. oh, this is related to the nuclear aspect. We're dealing with the same thing. 
Interesting. This has this has the the you know this has the American deep state panicked. Yeah. Someone else is in there. Someone else is in there. Absolutely. Um, Joseph, that is so fascinating. Uh, Reconosciuto. I want to say a couple of things about Reconosciuto. You brought him up uh, in perspective with the Oklahoma City bombing and mm -hmm. what he described there. Mm -hmm. And we know that because he decided to assist Hamilton, he got uh, raided with this bogus meth lab charge and all the rest. And a lot of people who looked at that case originally, including the original judge, said they didn't think it held up well. And then that guy didn't get reappointed. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we know something funny was going on there. They keep him in jail. And then they let him out in 2017. He's out for six months. And then, whoo, you're back in, in prison again. Mm -hmm. um, but Reconoscito had an unusual background in that he was – you know, in a sense, a genius, very young, identified that way. But his dad ran the Reconosciuto Advertising Agency, and his partner in that was someone named Fred Crispin. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in some of those early <laughs> affidavits that uh, Reconosciuto is giving about his background, he says, well, you know, Chrisman, you know, I, I had done various things with Chrisman growing up. You know, oh, like, well, I bet he did. <laughs> <laughs> Chrisman is so, uh, you know, he's at the foundation of the UFO file. He's involved uh -huh. in government assassination speculation, even through the Garrison trial, who actually puts him on the stand. Garrison actually puts him. He's involved in the Moray Island UFO thing. Exactly. You know, and he's involved with those B B uh, twenty seven Marauders or whatever they were. That, yes. That <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and so he's involved with Reconosciuto's father. Well, gee whiz. <laughs> yeah, right. And there's a whole chapter in Kenneth Arnold's book about yeah. Chrisman. Uh, yeah. So we know that Chrisman is operating on that deep state level all the way back to the 40s Holy his cow. his uh, partner is reconosciuto's dad and he is part of the you know environment that reconosciuto grows up in is doing you know unusual things for this guy like bugging uh people <laughs> that he's investigating <laughs> so uh what is the <laughs> elephant in the room there because you've got the assassination piece and the ufo file around well, if there's an, I'll, I'll tell you the elephant in the room that occurs to me with, you know, the, you're, you're laying something out there I've never heard before. <laughs> so, you know, Fred Christman and Reconosciuto's daddy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what do you make of that, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I make of it. Reconosciuto, um, if you, if you look at his, early days you can go find these newspaper articles of him doing some bizarre science project like you know how to how to make a laser that will shoot plasma to bore a hole through your bank vault door you know all, <laughs> sorts, of, all, all sorts of bizarre bizarre stuff for a kid doing a science fair project um I, I tend to believe that Reconosciuto when he says that he helped work on advanced uh, projects, particularly triggering projects for nuclear weapons, uh, is telling the truth. And I tend to think that when Reconosciuto says that that there were molecular chain bombs at work on on the Oklahoma City bombing, huh. a, a, a molecular chain bomb is basically you set up, you know, it's a it's a fuel aired bomb. So it's got the two-stage device where you disperse the uh, the propellant in the atmosphere, and then you detonate that propellant using the oxygen in the atmosphere as the oxidizer. That's what makes fuel air bombs so very potent, because you're dealing with a lot of tiny explosions that are setting up, you know, a massive shock wave. Well, the modification to this idea is in in popping loose and dispersing the, the fuel, you set up a chain molecule 
with that that dispersal via electrical means and then that chain molecule you can you can literally kind of take and wrap around something and then you detonate it electrically and you, you pass a current through it yes so it's like a detonation cord you know when you're just passing a current through it and it blows up well reconosciuto maintained on one of the one of the post oklahoma city bombing uh, investigations, and he was maintaining this incidentally to Ted Gunderson. Of all people. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh it's, wow! You can't make this stuff up, folks. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> just you know, this is like a bad Hollywood B movie that you just can't make up. But I tend to think Reconnaissance FBI may, agent there. Well, yeah, I, I tend to think that Reconnaissance may be onto something. Yeah, uh, because. He knows the advanced technology. He knows the advanced technology. He knows that it will look like it's doing the same thing as as a contact demolition on those columns in the mirror building. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the problem there is, other than a f- one or two witnesses that claim they saw Andrea Strassmeyer, you know, helping wire the, <laughs> wire the thing. Yeah, Andy the German. A- Andy the German, yeah. <laughs> That, uh, your, other your research that, on that just off the charts. Well, yeah, but Mike, you know, to have Michael Riccardo uh, doing all of this, I've got the guy on. You know, I've got that that DVD of Riccardo talking to Ted Gunderson. Fantastic. About, and and at a certain point, he says, uh, "Well, you know, we're going to have to talk about some of those matters off the air." And then <laughs> the <tapes> are <laughs> Um, so why, why do I think that's interesting vis-a-vis the elephant in the room in Christman? Because if you look back at Christman, and this is going to sound weird, and his involvement in the Maury Island UFO story, it's, it's Christman that's made. Oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Marty, I think they zapped him. Uh, well, I think they did. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Let's see if we can add him back here. Yeah, I was there. I, I clicked a button and, and uh, <laughs> it, all went, it all disappeared. Anyway, Chrisman is involved in the Maury Island UFO, and he's one of the people that s- maintains that he saw this molten slag yes. coming down from the Maury Island UFO. Right. So whatever Chrisman's involved with, if he's telling the truth about mm-hmm. the Maury Island UFO, he's involved in something pyrotechnical. And that's right up Michael Riccardo's alley. That's not interesting. Uh, so he could have given him a kind of on-the-job training. Yeah. Because after all, Riccardo is growing up with, with this guy. You yeah. Know, because his dad is partners with him. Right. Um, and... You know, it's on the record that he had him doing these little tasks, you know, these little errands as a teenager for him. Right. So, um, but it is interesting, isn't it? Because right in the middle of all this, we have the signature of Reconosciuto. Now he's got the UFO file advanced tech signature mm-hmm. that just somehow got in to mm-hmm. all this. Mm-hmm. And it's undeniable. <laughs> There's a UFO link. Yes. And it's in a blog that I've got coming out this week. Oh, good. Um, Physicists have recently been able to break the speed of light barrier. Okay. And the way they did this was through something called group velocity. And here it comes in a plasma. (laughs) <laughs> which I just love. Fascinating. That because number one, that should ring a bell. Yes. <laughs> and number, I mean, and just number, didn't Reich say that his UFOs were plasma ships? Yeah, yeah. 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 And this this is exactly if you're if you're playing around with fuel air bombs and all of that good stuff, like the kind of shooter, at some point you're dealing basically with plasmas of a certain type. You know, cool plasma certainly, but uh, they're they're doing all of this stuff, and I'm I'm thinking, okay, well, could this have been something that 
that they've been playing around with for a long time? Answer, yeah. And they're just now letting us know. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Like, like they always wow. do. Uh, it could be while we're getting such a UFO push in Congress and the government and everything else, it's those types of findings. Yeah. And, oh, I trust this government, which has never <laughs> lied, <laughs> like, ever, ever about anything in its entire <laughs> history to tell me, yeah, those UFOs are unfriendly. We better go out there and shoot a bunch of them down. You know? You're a threat. It's a threat. <laughs> They're a threat. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I want to, I do want to ask this since we're on the UFO thing, I'm going to round this out and mm -hmm. connect it this way. Everywhere we turn lately mm -hmm. in relation to Space Force, in relation to this new Arrow UFO office, which is Project Blue Book 2022 Redux, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's all the people involved are nuclear personnel. Uh -huh. So General Chance over there, who's taken over Space Force, guess where he was stationed for five years? Malmstrom Air Force oh. Base. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the home of the UFO. The home incident. of the UFO shutting down the missiles. Missiles. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, this, this one just came out. Here's another one. This came out yesterday. Uh, where they had Lou Elizondo, who's the guy that TTSA put out there, yeah. the saying, oh, I quit the Pentagon because I'm you know, doing this whole UFO disclosure thing. And he ran around changing his story left and right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is he ringing a bell? <laughs> well, you did it. You got your own. I got my own <laughs> little blue chicken. <laughs> um, this guy... Now they found out that he is a security officer for a government nuclear program. That's who he is. That finally came out, and he's been working all along for the government, and he works for Space Force now. So uh, UFO nuclear mm -hmm. interlocking link. We're getting it left and right all of a sudden. What is that about? Um. My best guess, Daniel, is it's it's uh, it's about plasma and it's about fusion. Mm -hmm. Because the one thing that they have not thought to do, at least publicly, you know, they they're still trying to bring hot fusion through the big tokamak reactor thing, you know, the big magnets, the containment magnets. Yeah. But they're they're not doing the one thing, in my opinion, that they need to do to make it work and that's rotate the plasma itself. Interesting. That's, that's the bell. Yes. Once they do that, I suspect you're going to see and the reason that that you see the space force and the UFO thing and all that involved is they're going to try to stage something. Mm -hmm under the guise of which they can roll out the technology. Oh, right. Oh, if we're going to, if we're going to be flying and fighting these guys, we have to have a propulsion system to do that. You know, we've got to, we've got to clamp down on security and roll out the technology. That's what I think they're up to. Wow. They're going to create their, I know it sounds kooky, but they're going to create a UFO incident to roll out the technology. And they could create it the best way to do it is over a nuclear plant because then they can invoke Bingo. national security. Bingo. That is fascinating. Um, when you look at that, so if they're moving into this phase of what's going on with this, the fact that the nuclear personnel are being stationed and being elevated in various things like Arrow and Space Force um, – gives them the ability to say, well, we're experts at both. Right. Right. And again, I don't, I don't trust the government as far as I can throw it. Right. Uh, particularly with things like nuclear weapons. Um, right. I, I, I think, I think there's another reason they're doing all of this. And I go back to what I have been maintaining all along. And that is when you detonate a nuclear weapon, it acts for a very brief moment 
as the transducer of energy from the configuration of, of local space time. And that's why the, the yields for the same device, if detonated at a different time and a different place, are going to vary just slightly. Interesting. And, you know, huh. th the big example of that being Castle Bravo, you know, predicting it was going to have a yield of between six and seven and a half megatons, and it runs away to 15. Well, yeah. you know, that's that's kind of a big oops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not the kind of oops you want to make. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the business that the Air Force tried to tell us at the time, well, we didn't realize, and, and to me this is this is just a knee slapper, we didn't realize that lithium-7 was going to enter the fusion reaction. Wow. Bull roar they didn't realize that because Dr. Ronald Richter down in Argentina told them that. Interesting. <laughs> That's why they interviewed the guy after they blew off their bomb. And he told them all about it. And he also told them, if you recall, that plasma under certain conditions acts as what? a transducer for, quote, what we call the zero-point energy, unquote. Amazing. Right out of Richter's mouth. That is fascinating. Well, considering that he's the advanced German weapons project guy, he would know. He would know. Um, and you've gone on the record saying that they were using aspects of this nuclear tech before anybody. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Why? Who's Richter working with inside of Nazi Germany? Well, he's working for the Allgemeine Elektricitätsgesellschaft, who's, who also works for that company. Well, one Dr. Kurt Davis. Wow. Mm. What is Kurt Davis's specialty? Well, it ain't rocket science. Right. It's high voltage and plasmas. And who ends up as the head of, of the Apollo missions at Cape Canaveral during Apollo? Dr. Kurt Davis. Davis. Who ends up, after the whole thing is shut down, who ends up as head of NASA's UFO desk? Dr. Kurt Davis. Davis. Wow. That is a thread. <laughs> That's a thread. That's like the Nazi bell project, direct thread, all the way through Apollo and everything yep. else to the UFO file. Yep. Oh, and by the way, he also ends up on the board of Otrog, you know, that secret, <laughs> right. that secret German compound over in the Congo. The prequel <laughs> of SpaceX, right? The, the prequel of SpaceX. And thank, thank you, Mikhail Gorbachev, for exposing <laughs> that, because it was Gorbachev that let that little cat out of the bag. He did. He yeah, did. He did. Um, Gorbachev just passed away. Yeah. And I'm just saying my thank yous. Gorbachev yeah. <laughs> <laughs> went on the record at mm -hmm. the New York Press Club saying that Reagan took him aside and said, if there's an alien invasion, are you going to help us fight them? And that he said Reagan was absolutely serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody like, who was in the room like Kissinger and Charlie Rose didn't laugh or do anything. They were just freaked out and they were hoping that he didn't say this. And George Schultz is looking like he's <laughs> going to collapse uh, <laughs> on the spot, but Gorbachev sticks with it. And he says, you know, I'm sorry I, I brought it up, but he, he was absolutely dead serious when he said to me, yeah. will you help us with this alien invasion? Um, Gorbachev's legacy, so many different legacies, helping to end the cold war and so on and opening up Russian society for better, for worse. Hmm. Um, but that part, putting that on the record, uh, what does that tell us? <sighs> to be blunt, what yeah. it tells me is that when Colonel Corso wrote his day after Roswell, and said that the whole doctrine of mutually assured destruction wasn't about the United States or the Soviet Union being able to destroy each other. It was really about being able to destroy any potential invader by overwhelming them with nuclear missiles. Wow. It tells me there may be something to that. So both sides build up their nuclear arsenal so a third force doesn't come in and mess with either 
right. the world because collectively that's a problem. Yeah, collectively between them, they've got thousands, tens of thousands of warheads. Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And mad really doesn't make sense because you wouldn't no, of need course to keep not. piling it up. Yeah. Of course not. Of course not. Yeah. And now uh, it, it makes even more sense from the standpoint that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, nuclear weapons are all but obsolete. You don't need them anymore. Right. You know, you've got rods of God that can do the same dang thing, and you don't have the fallout problem. Right. You know, if, you want, if you want to blow up a Russian city, drop a tungsten rod on it, you know. Yeah. From, from outer space. That'll do the trick. And, and you, don't have, you don't have the nasty fallout. So you don't need them. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's fascinating. They might be kind of handy to deal with asteroids, though. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might be sort of interesting to kind of play around with to see what you can come up with for some propulsion ideas. Ah. You know, there's all sorts of nifty ways you can use these dang things that you, doesn't require blowing up a Russian city. You know? <laughs> Von Braun's uh, prediction there. <laughs> uh-huh. If, you know, hey, they're going to say killer asteroids at a certain point just before they say the fake UFO invasion. Yep. Interesting. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Joseph, you take the cake as <laughs> usual uh, on that. I have to ask you, twice in the last week, the Artemis rockets have not <laughs> been able to get off the ground. And it's really lamer and lamer explanations uh, I think I think NASA stands for not a space agency. <laughs> <laughs> but Bill Nelson is is out there saying, "Don't worry, we're going to go to Mars <laughs> on a chemical rocket." Uh huh. <laughs> uh huh. Um, so, look, as far as I'm concerned, Daniel, something is going on. Um. What it may be, I don't know. Mm. I mean, this the rocket itself is gigantic. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's Saturn V size. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it, it has a, a, a bigger uh, boosting power. So in other yes. words, yeah. it, you know, much bigger boosting power so they can launch a, a bigger payload with the dang thing. Um what 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 I'm afraid of is either they're they're following some sort of, you know, Hoagland esque type of of ritual timing with you know we we have to postpone it until the timing is just right. All right. Or my other fear is is that, and I'll be blunt, that that people have become so incompetent in this country. We we don't know how to launch a bottle rocket, much less a moon rocket. <laughs> right. Uh, and I, I'm very serious about that. You know, if you look if you look at the galloping insanity of our leadership class, what makes what makes anybody think that we we're capable of launching a moon rocket? Good point. We you know we've been relying on the Russians for years. Uh, so what happened? All of a sudden, we don't have any more Nazi scientists to build rockets for us. So now we don't. <laughs> now we don't know how. We forgot to do like the Russians did and have the Nazi scientists train us so that we can build our own rockets. <laughs> <laughs> well, that breakaway group now is just kind of <laughs> yeah. gone off into the distance. Yeah, they are. They're <laughs> see you later, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph, uh, I, I have to ask you this just. Uh -huh you know, fundamental opinion, and of course this ties in with the Artemis thing, why haven't we gone back to the moon in 50 years? Daniel, I don't know. The only thing that I can think of that, that makes any sense to me is, is uh, that somehow we were warned off. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing that does make a bit of sense is, is the Hoagland scenario. In other words, that there were so many ruins up there uh, that it became a hazard to do so, with that we just got lucky, uh -huh. you know, and didn't hit the dang stuff all the time. Uh, if you stop and think about it, his his scenario does rationalize that 
aspect of things rather nicely. And, you know, where does China decide to land its probe? Well, on the far side of the moon, of course. Right. Yeah, you know, <laughs> because that's so much easier to do. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. The ruins. The, yeah, yeah, the ruins, you know. Um, it, it could be something like that. I don't know. Well, they spent all those years airbrushing all of that stuff out of the oh. photos that they took. They probably were just like, we can't do this publicly anyway. Right. Um, right. That is absolutely. Well, you know, yeah. the nice thing is, is that the Russians didn't bother airbrushing the stuff out of, out right. of, <laughs> out of their moon photos. Here, see what we found? You know? <laughs> Isn't that why we have the C-3PO head there on yeah, the moon? Yeah, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, um, look at the picture our Phobos Mars probe took of this weird-looking thing. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Absolutely. I wonder what it is, comrades. <laughs> Somehow these things are all tied together. Um, of course wow. they're. Just amazing today. And uh, for the record, Marty, I have to ask you this question. I, I forgive you, forgive me if I've already asked you this question. I'm sure that I have. But I'm going to go back to your meeting here just at the end with Casalaro one last time. Did you get any impression from Casalaro when you met him that he thought there may have been a hidden backdoor in the promise software before it was stolen and the DOG was involved? Now, the way it's been explained throughout this, yeah, it, it kind of comes around to that. It makes sense of it why he's so nervous. Yeah. It makes sense. Absolutely. Well, it makes and, sense and, to me. You, know, you have yeah, to think yeah. about what was going on throughout that time period, too. Well, the reason it makes sense to me, yeah, is not only what's going on at the time period, but he's the one that puts together the whole idea that there's a back door in the first place. Right. And he's not going to be he's 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 not a stupid man. He's going to be able to think, okay. Just exactly when was this back door really put in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, the the idea must have occurred to him. It had to have occurred to him. You would think. You yeah. would think that would Absolutely. have to be a question. Yeah, somebody that's taken down, you know, so many other rabbit holes. Uh, he, Bingo. He's, yeah. Bingo. And if he's carting around an accordion folder of you know notes on all of this stuff and and this software stuff and and he he's got to be thinking along these lines and i'll tell you I'll, I'll go even further marty my guess here is that he's not only thinking this but he's trying to assemble enough evidence so that he can go back to bill hamilton and say this is what i think is actually going on ah. mm -hmm. And that may be why Hamilton contacted me. Maybe Casalero intimated yep. to him at some point. You know, uh, it makes sense. That's fascinating. Um, you know what's interesting about that, and this is how we can round out the conversation. I have his the date of his death is August tenth, nineteen ninety one. I have you, Marty, meeting him in. August, September period, 89, and again, that same period in 90. Mm -hmm. So would you say by the time, the last time you saw him, it's about a year later that he dies? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, in fact, there might have been a chance for a third meeting there had he lived because that... Could have been. That, yeah. Because that whole thing with the chalet and, and the skiing... Uh, event would have happened again in that August uh -huh. every year period without fail. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And it's a three or four day event. Okay. So uh, he's dying and, just before that happens really. Cause that's August 10th. And obviously this, this happens a little bit later. Right. Um, so that would have been maybe, you know, a follow up if there was going to be a follow up that would, that would have happened. Uh, when you look back just on the fate of the idea of you had these chance encounters, how do you feel about that? Just looking back at Casamaro. Nervous. 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 Yeah. 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 Nervous that I, you know, 
I, I don't even think I mentioned this to my cousin uh, when we spoke back in the early 2000s. I mean, no, you didn't. Yeah. No, you I, didn't. I, I didn't. Ma I didn't talk to too many people about it. No, Marty. The other night when you and I were talking, that was the first I'd ever heard of it from you, and uh -huh. that's why. That's why I thought, oh, we've got to get this on the record. Yeah, absolutely. You know, number one, it, it's it's safer in a way to do so rather than carry it around. You know, as as a quiet loose end. Yeah. And I'm, I, you know, I hate to be so blunt about it, but it, it is much better for us to do this and get it on the record. No than, question. Than to have you, you know, <laughs> carrying around information that uh, would be something that someone else might, you know, decide to keep silent, keep you silent yeah. in a permanent way. Um, yeah. Well, well Mark, you know, that makes me want to ask you this, which is why why didn't you mention it all these years? <laughs> uh well, because I, I kind of know somebody that's really close to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, top of the shelf. Mm -hmm. And went to you know, as kids, we grew up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh you know, uh, he married into one of the families. So, got us. Yeah. Interesting. So, you were just like, you know, it's a weird connection. And I had these conversations, but I'm not going to go out and talk about it. But now we're lucky enough that you brought this forward. And uh, how do you feel having talked about it now? Mm. <laughs> Nervous. <laughs> 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 I think it's important you put it on the record. I really do. Yeah, I, I wouldn't feel I I would be the exact opposite. I, I would have been nervous carrying it around and not talking about it. Again. Yeah, well I was because you yeah, know well. I didn't didn't speak to too many people and uh, needless to say kind of lost track of uh, the people that I was grow that I grew up with, you know, and, and yeah. swam and wrestled against. Right. Right, absolutely. Um, any last impressions? Just thinking about Casalaro and those meetings. Um, well, you know, I, f I find it rather uh, rather strange that I just had the opportunity to meet somebody like that. Uh, it just it blew me away the moment I found out that he had been murdered. I mean, it it floored me. I'm, I must have uh, walked around my house for oh, days just trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And That, uh, you that know, would have totally freaked me out. Yeah, it did. It did. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I bet. But Incredible. now, you know, I, I look back on it and, and think, wow, I was that close and, you know. Uh, I got to meet one incredible investigator who compiled an enormous amount of it, evidence. You know, this is all after the fact that I discovered how much evidence he put out there. It's huge. It, it's discombobulated, yes, mm -hmm. you know, as some people say. Uh, but it's a lot of evidence. Well, just just what they've been able to piece together of what he uncovered. And and every researcher I've ever read, Marty, acknowledges the fact that that what they've been able to piece together of what he uncovered is significant. But all of them acknowledge that it must be nowhere near what he managed to uncover and carried around in that that big accordion file. One can only imagine, cuz yeah, 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 unbelievable. Um, and Castellaro himself, you know, he knew he was on the verge of something. He also knew he was in danger and yeah. the situation caught up with him. But in retrospect, he opened up a gigantic window on all this. So I guess we owe him a huge debt in that sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Uh, Marty, thank you. I know everyone's going to be very happy that you put this on the record. And uh, I think it is brave of you to come out with it now. So thank you yeah. very much. And it's going to fill in some blanks for people about Castellaro. 
and his life there. And just, you know, a chance encounter can reveal a, a great deal. But there's a few things, I think, in what he told you that oh, um, yeah. provide lines of inquiry. Let's well, see. he didn't kill himself. And, you know, um, uh, the uh, there was a uh, Buffalo uh, lawman who Danny knew, somebody from Buffalo, who also uh, – was told by Danny prior to him, you know, that he would never do that. Yeah. He would never. Yeah. Cuz thanks a lot. I appreciate you doing this for us. I really do. All right. Guys. Nicely done. Enjoy. Thanks. <laughs> thank thank, you, thank you, you, Bernie. Joseph off the charts and uh I, I know people are going to be interested in <laughs> No question. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, thanks so much for putting everything on the record today. All right. Not a problem. Thanks, cuz. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Dan. you, Joseph. We'll, we'll see you soon. Yep. Yeah, bye-bye. All right. We talk soon. There you have it, everyone. Unbelievable uh, testimony by someone who uh, is related, uh, is the cousin of Dr. Joseph Farrell, and just off the charts uh, testimony there relating to the Danny Casolaro promise software story, which we're still dealing with the ramifications and the question mark that comes out of the entire uh, sequence of testimony there is, is there another player who got into that promise software and adopted a backdoor into it before the Department of Justice stole it and set off this worldwide uh, blackmail and info uh, hoarding. And that, that, of course, sparked this entire uh, worldwide blackmail slash info running operation, which we're still in the throes of now and may relate to deeper issues around advanced technology. And of course, the secret system of finance, the black budgets, it, it all gets played into this and uh, through the figure of Danny Casolaro. And then we have a first uh, person account of what was going on in his mind shortly before uh, he unfortunately died as uh, in the line of duty trying to get the story out so just an amazing story and uh, we will be back with you on friday with the x series of course join us at 8 p.m live and we're going to be doing uh, coming up an x episode on michael reconosciuto so be sure to stay tuned for that thanks so much uh, for joining me here today and uh, we'll be back with you soon